Well, our thoughts are in training here. If we can control the thoughts, then when we're loosed in the spirit world, where there is no pain, but there is fear and hope and desire, we will create well in the sense that we'll create things that bring joy and happiness and goodness, not fear and stress and worry and loneliness. Do you see this living is practice at controlling our thoughts, which is what Jesus is guiding in the Sermon on the Mount. You know, don't just um, not hate others, but don't be angry with, don't imagine, a, for instance, also um, adultery. Be in charge of your thoughts so that we, when we unleash you in dreams, your dreams are always good because you're automatically mastering your thoughts to the goodness and harmony that you've learned here in the classroom in this world in the world of time and matter and space. You see, when you dream, I mean, I had a dream where I had all sorts of powers. I could fly and glide and, and bless people as I sped over a hall of crowd people. And I was imagining in the dream many strange things that, well, particularly in my life, although certain characters were from the life, I think Carol was in it, and so on. And I got confronted with a situation of a very strange person who was out of control and he would put these butterfly things, which were more of a mechanical butterfly, not a real one, on, on the person on their arm, say. And you had to tear it off, but if you tore it off and away, it would, in a sense, leave the sting in, which would be um, death and annihilation. You see? But as I remember now, of course, there was no pain. I tried to get other people to tear it off quickly before it took effect, and they somehow didn't in the flap. And I went to tear it off, but couldn't tear it. And then, you know, well, the dream ended, didn't it? And I guess that was the point at which God woke me up. You know, I woke up anyway. And, um, but as I remember, hey, I was therefore troubled in the dream, greatly troubled and fearful, but there was no pain, because there's no body in the dream, not attached dissociated from actually. You feel you have a body, but it's a spirit body, of course, just that you don't really realize that in the dream. So say you're expecting pain, but it doesn't happen. And um, in a sense, the bad outcome didn't happen because, of course, I'm now awake and it was a dream. And the dream is now gone. I'm no longer living in the dream. And I was at some point definitely blessing. I was aware of God. There was definitely some awareness, some consciousness, some thinking about God in the dream. But I don't mean I felt in the dream that God woke me from it or something like that. I just I found that I woke up, nothing happened after the dilemma I was in. 
um, you know, conceivably you go into another dream if you don't have a body to wake into. Which of course I do have. I'm talking to you now in that body, aren't I? So dreams are strange, but you fear pain in dreams sometimes, but you don't feel it. I think that is the case. And if you do feel it, I've got a feeling that's what wakes you up. And you therefore attend to the body in this world, of course, for real. Well, what we call for real. But what do I glean from this? It comes to me that we are here to train the mind. Master the mind so that when you are given a complete freedom, to dream and create and live in the dream that you make, you are safeguarded. Of course, my understanding of the true safeguard is to have the reality of God in the dream so that you can continue talking to and appealing to God when you do run into difficulty. But better still, well I think better still, I'm not certain, it's the dream in which you are in charge. Harmony is in charge. God in you, if you like, is in charge. You are trained to control the mind. And we do that in, in the world we're in here by guarding against temptation, by practicing being on guard against temptation. How do you guard against temptation? You rule the mind, and temptation has no power. Jesus' solution to temptation? Reason, yes, but always quoting scripture. Walks back on something that's known, tried and tested, if you like, in the world that we're in. So he quotes scripture back at the evil that he's being tempted with. He recognizes it as evil. He's trained, you see. Fully trained. Fully equipped. And so it says in the scripture, so Satan just gives up and leaves him for a season. Tested him with three temptations. Not in anywhere. Hmm, let's really think how another goes. Satan's thinking, you know, so to speak. Hmm. So, eagerly take hold of this opportunity to try. It's a wonderful opportunity. Use it for all that it's worth which is absolutely a magnificent gift of God, life eternal. In the heavenly kingdom, more to the point, we don't just want life eternal with endless, endless, endless trials, do we? We want a life eternal that embraces the kingdom of God eternally in it. So that's the move from being, if you like, um, uh, Judaic, if you like. Well, perhaps it's safer to say Old Testament to New. Hmm? Legalistic, obedient. Well, even the obedience is certainly a foundation, isn't it? Because you're going to do all you can to keep the rules. Just that the rules become very demanding and you can really only achieve them 
from a devotion, great love. And then you enter the kingdom of heaven with great riches. This extraordinary, I was going to say spiritual body, spiritual mind. that masters all to the goodness of God. Not quite sure how to put it, but very good. Thank you, Heavenly Father. So as I understand it, imagination is very good. Rudolf Steiner's contribution, imagination training as a child is vital. You know, I've said before, haven't I, that if you can't imagine something good, how can you move towards creating it? Life requires imagination, visualization, and then some hope of attaining it, and then the effort to attain it. And we usually adjust as we go along and attain something else. And life is a continual process of doing that. Eternal life in the kingdom of heaven is therefore, in that sense, understood to be incredibly creative. But we need a safe foundation. What we're hoping for, we need something sort of that guards against damaging it with imagination as we go along. Our imagination needs to be trained so that we imagine only good, harmonious, blessing things, things of blessing and goodness, things compatible with the wonderfulness of God, our Heavenly Father. And when we can all do that, we can be given our freedom. Uh, it won't be turned against us to being a burden and, and us imagining great fears stresses and problems and harms, even perhaps imagining that we can be afflicted by pain and so on, perhaps even imagining the pain, I'm not sure, not sure about that one, I think it needs a body, a physical body, but I'm not sure of that because I think the physical body may be the result of thought. Perhaps not our thought, perhaps God's. I'm not sure. But what I am impressed by is that we're in training to control our imagination to good. So I think, if you like, it's times on to the right thing there. But how do we safeguard the imagination? so that we only think along safe lines. I think that's what understanding temptation is about. Realizing that our life unfolds according to what we think and pursue and that we should need and must contain, control what we think. Now we can't do this, we find it's a wild horse, the mind goes all over the place. We haven't got it untamed at all. We've tried it with obedience, but, well, it doesn't seem to work too well. We're tempted, and we suffer accordingly in the longer run. If we are overcome by love and gratitude, I think we are then not tempted, because our desire, our fundamental will, purpose and values are our safeguard. In other words, the who of what we are is our safeguard, 
And that's what we're training and building here in this world. We're making ourselves proof against evil. Evil thoughts, evil intentions, harmful, disharmonious. Disharmonious, inharmonious, well, non-harmonious. You know, there's a nice character in one of the um, things that Harriya used to watch, and the character was Discord. And Discord seemed to manage to cause chaos and discord wherever he went. And that's, well, example to us, isn't it, of, my goodness, you don't want to be that. It's a menace. It's an absolute menace. We bring harmony, not discord. We are training harmony. Hmm. Thank you, Heavenly Father. So to come back to the beginning, when I say our thoughts are in training here, we want a disposition that, in all circumstances, with any difficulty or that which might cause difficulty, to have an automatic switch into awareness of the presence of God. And by God I mean the personification of what we truly value. So we value peace and joy and freedom from pain, freedom from chaos, freedom from destruction. We value creativity, um, beauty, loveliness, uh, joy, peace. Do you see now if my mind in the dream automatically switches to thinking about that, this personification, God, personification of all goodness, then it's no longer dreaming up bad things in the dream. You've changed the dream because the dream is simply what you are thinking and consequence of what you are thinking. Well, you have a disposition now that automatically switches it to calling out to God. And God is, in your mind, the personification of solution, uh, freedom from whatever this evil is. Do you see you have a disposition to automatically switch to the heavenly mode? And that's what you need to have when you part from this preset dream of um, the real world, as we call it. It's to some extent hardened, set by God, and it takes quite a lot of moving. It takes time, especially in this one. You have to think good things for a long time to bring the good thing about. You know, if you're going to do the washing up, you have to keep your uh, being, your attention, yourself on doing the washing up for quite a while to get the washing up done and the, the place cleared. It takes a lot of training here. And that is the training. You get in the habit of being able to sustain what you understand to be a good purpose. Which means in any dream situation, any situation that's easily and solely affected by thought, you will be master of it. Master in the sense that you will be able to control it to good as you understand it. Not the harm that the dream seems to be attacking you with. So our thoughts are in training here so that when you enter a world that's not safeguarded, actually, by the rigidity of the semi-permanence that God gives to this universe of space, matter, and time, and change, and so on, it's semi-permanent. It doesn't respond instantly to your changing thoughts. You have to practice holding a thought firmly 
you know, I'm going to be an economist. And, uh, you know, you continue doing this study across a period of years even. You know, I'm going to pass this exam. So I continue the effort of visualizing and doing that which I think will lead to passing the exam. It takes quite a lot of time to shift it, shift reality to a situation in which I have now passed the exam. I've got it. So you are practicing here to hold values and habits of thought that are safeguarded, safeguarding you in a situation where the whole of your reality is free. You're no longer bound by the rigidity of the physical world, semi-rigidity. You are completely free. It changes instantly upon the thoughts you have, which means you want the thoughts you have to be safe to you and to others. Otherwise, you can't be in this utterly free and incredibly capable state of being a member of the host of heaven. Because obviously you'll bring in harmony and chaos to the place if you can't use that freedom, if you don't use that freedom always to the good of all, including yourself and God and the host. So we are in training here. And in the dream, you get a quick measure, an indication. It's telling you to what extent you're not yet there. You have bad dreams. Oh, that went on a while and I got worried. I shouldn't have got worried, of course. I should have instantly thought, God is my answer. And God is my answer because he's the personification of all the thoughts of creativity and goodness and blessing. And in an instant dream, the dream changes instantly, therefore, to its good, benign, blessed solution, that which is in harmony with God, because it's God that you're now thinking of, not uh, the... Um, um, the evil of the dream that could have been there. It's instant, you see. In fact, your training here in this world changes your basic values such that given the freedom of the dream and you're creating it, your creation is according to these values which are good and in harmony with God love and all blessing and creativity and life, life eternal for all. Do you see, you are in training here in this world, space, time of un uncertainty, matter, this semi-rigidity that we're faced with here. The astonishing thing to us is that you are not an object, inanimate object. You are life, you actually imagine something different to what it might be becoming or staying and you uh, interrupt the course of events in the world. You introduce events that change the future. It's very slow and sticky here and takes time which safeguards you against the chaos you would produce. You have to work at it, and you also have to build this habit here of sustaining and holding good purpose and good visualization, good imagination, instead of, oh, woe is me, I don't think I can do this, and what about such and such a risk, and, uh, and you're swamped. Do you see? You're training here to avoid that chaos, to be single-minded, if you like, uh, in a good way. Um, on, on good purposing. You're automatically selecting creative things that are according to your values. Your values are trained here to be good. You find out 
when they're not good and you change them fast if you're wise and if you're making good use of the time. So it's good to be wise and making good use of the time in this way. And your dreams will indicate this. Your dreams give you some measure of what you're like when you're given your freedom of thought at the minute. Whoa, I get the odd nightmare. Well, I don't want that. Now, what's what can I do to safeguard my thinking in the dreams, in my complete freedom? I'm not sure how complete it is because we would have endless nasty nightmares and ghastly situations if we didn't wake and change from the dream. And I assume God is in some way monitoring our thoughts to rescue us from these frightening pitfalls that we could make. And we wake up, oh, oh, that was a bad dream, I'm glad it was a dream, goodness, you know. But learn by it. Learn that, oh my goodness, why didn't I think of you, Father, in the dream? In a dream that's controlled by my thoughts, I could have changed it myself instantly, simply by thinking of you, by bringing you into my consciousness. And so we're practicing in this world of time and space, uncertainty and matter, change and so on. We are practicing holding to good thoughts, whatsoever is good and lovely, we think on these things. We practice thanking God, which draws our mind to it and fills us with gratitude and the motivation to value that which is good and lovely and to be filled with love for him in response to it and all the goodness that that entails. Do you see? This life is a fantastic opportunity for you to become a member of the host of heaven, an eternal, wonderful being that has life, fullness of life, life eternal. So you're going to practice mindfulness of God. It's your key to everything. And what's the practice? Oh, very simple. What's always good and lovely? Think on these things as much as you possibly can. Moment by moment, day in and day out. See how you are transformed by it. Even here, in this sticky world, it becomes less and less sticky. It changes, it responds. You know, you're back to Jesus. You can say to this mountain, shift, and it goes. Just like that. And be careful, there might be people living on the mountain. But, you know, do you see? You wouldn't say it, in fact, because you're concerned about the harmony here. But do you see? You have this power. You can even have it here, in this world, in this life. How much more in the pure fluidity and wonderfulness of heaven. Bless you, and you are blessed. Thank you, Dad.